Hello and thank you for joining me again. My last video was the first of several about some of the things that Paul said that I think have been misunderstood and twisted so that it appears that he had a different gospel than Jesus preached in the Gospels. And I made the suggestion that if you try to forget the theology that you've learned, and if you go back and read the Gospels as best as you can with an open mind, just open to whatever Jesus says about salvation and how it works. And if you then get really clear on what the issue was in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council, and if you then go and read Paul's letters through the lens of the teachings of Jesus with the Acts 15 issue in mind, you'll begin to see what Paul is really saying. And it's not what many evangelicals think Paul is saying. It's not what I thought he was saying. In this video, I'm going to talk about an important Protestant doctrine that many would say is a teaching of Paul. They would attribute it to Paul, but which I think is actually something that never crossed Paul's mind. It would have been a foreign idea to him. And some of what I'm going to say probably will sound totally preposterous to some people, which I totally understand. It would have sounded that way to me too a few years ago. And um, some of what I say may get some people into a defensive posture simply because of how important this doctrine is to so many of us personally and because of how important it is to the Protestant understanding of the gospel. Um, but I ask that you please uh, just hear me out and try to consider these things as objectively as you can. So one of the most important doctrines of Protestant theology is the imputed righteousness of Christ. It teaches that Jesus' righteousness is imputed to or credited to, transferred to those who trust in him alone for salvation. The idea is that God clothes believers in the righteousness of his Son, and they wear it like a robe, like a perfect robe of righteousness. And it's because of this righteousness of Christ, this alien righteousness, because it doesn't come from us. It's because of that that we can be welcomed into God's kingdom. And so we don't do anything to get it other than believe in Jesus, and we don't do anything to keep it other than believe in Jesus. Part of why it's by grace through faith alone, right? And some would say that this is the most important part of the gospel, the thing that ultimately separates Christianity from other religions because we do nothing to get or keep this righteousness of Christ other than believe. I watched an interview of R.C. Sproul by Mark Driscoll in 2010. And Driscoll asked Sproul, who was a famous uh, Reformed theologian, um, what he thought was going to be the most important theological battle of our time. And Sproul said that it'll be over the person and work of Christ, and he emphasized the imputed righteousness of Jesus in particular, because some, some people under the Protestant umbrella have called this doctrine and, and other doctrines into question as they've begun to see Paul's writing in a different light. And so Driscoll asked Sproul, what do we lose if we lose the imputed righteousness of Jesus? And Sproul answered, I think you lose Christianity. I think it is that important. So according to the late Dr. Sproul, this doctrine is so important that if we lose it, we lose Christianity itself. And that is a big statement. And he may not represent the exact position of every Reformed or Lutheran theologian in saying that, I'm not really sure, but I think most evangelicals who are into theology would agree with him that the imputed righteousness of Jesus is an essential doctrine, and that it is so essential that if you don't understand it, then you are not really understanding what Jesus has done, and you're not really understanding the gospel itself. And I would have completely agreed with that a few years ago. Um, it 
The doctrine really impacts the way many of us disciple and encourage each other, particularly when it comes to um, the sanctification process and the struggle with sin. So someone might confess a sin to a fellow Christian, and the other person might say to the one confessing something like, hey, remember God still sees you as righteous because you have Jesus' righteousness. Or even when you were right in the middle of committing that sin, when God looked at you, he saw you as pure and righteous before him because of Jesus' imputed righteousness. And so we remind each other of this and we comfort each other with this. But I think something is not right about this. And in fact, I think something is very wrong about this. Um, it, it's, this doctrine is part of how I comforted myself in the face of some of my ongoing habitual sins over the years. And it seemed to help me because uh, it soothed me and assured me, you know, God, okay, God still sees me as righteous no matter what, no matter what I do, no matter what happens. But in reality, I think, I think it was actually hurting me because it kept me from fully realizing the danger that I was in and what the consequences would be if I didn't actually repent and turn from my sin. And so I, I sort of went on this theological journey learning more about, about church history and theological development. And there's two things that I discovered um, as, I, as I looked into this a little more carefully over the last three years that made me very, very uncomfortable about this doctrine. Uh, and it wasn't easy for me to be objective about this and to think critically about it and to bring it under the light of scrutiny because it was so important to me personally. But I wanted to know the truth about it. And so I had to be willing to get uncomfortable. So the first thing that I discovered is that the Bible never once comes out and actually teaches this idea explicitly. And I know that might sound crazy to some people because we have our verses in Romans or 2 Corinthians or Philippians that we point to and we just think it's so clear. But it's because of the glasses that we're wearing. Um, if, you, if you go back and you read those passages carefully, you see they're not act it's not actually in the text. Um, they talk about a righteousness of God or a righteousness from God that we receive by faith or, or, or uh, becoming the righteousness of God. But those passages could be taken a number of different ways. It never actually uses the words righteousness of Christ. And it never uses this imagery of being clothed in Jesus' righteousness and wearing it like a robe unconditionally. And so I'm, you know, a few years ago I might have responded to that and said, well, the Bible never uses the word Trinity either. No, this is different. Um, take the Trinity, for example. The Bible doesn't use that word explicitly but it does explicitly teach that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. It does explicitly teach the divinity of Jesus. That is crystal clear in many passages from multiple authors. But Paul, in these few passages from Paul, he never makes it clear that the righteousness he's talking about, that we receive by faith, is Jesus' righteousness, and that it makes us pure and blameless before God no matter what we do going forward. That is going way beyond what Paul actually says. All we know is that it is a righteousness that we get through faith. It could mean several different things. And we have to look at what the rest of the New Testament says in order to understand what Paul means when he says that and what he doesn't mean, what he can't mean in saying that. So if Protestant theology is, is right, if, if this doctrine is true, and it really is at the heart of the gospel message, the imputed righteousness of Christ, then you would think that it would be explicitly taught all over the New Testament in no uncertain terms. You know, we, we should expect Jesus to be teaching it. We should expect the other apostles to be talking about it too, not just Paul. It should be just as prominent in the scriptures as the message of the kingdom of God or 
of God's grace or the death of Jesus as an atoning sacrifice or the resurrection, you know, the divinity of Jesus, the return of Jesus, the filling of the Holy Spirit, those kinds of things. It should be plastered all over the place, not just in a few passages from only one New Testament author. But it's not all over the place. And uh, like those other basics of the gospel are, and, and it never actually comes out and explicitly says it. That doesn't mean that it's not true, but it's significant. But there's another problem, and it was the combination of these two problems that um, made me really concerned when I really, when I really thought about this. The second thing that I learned is that this interpretation of the imputed righteousness of Christ only goes back to the time of the Reformers. As far as I know, it wasn't taught before the Reformation period. And that is a huge problem. Because that means that it is not a part of historic Christianity. It is not a part of apostolic Christianity. It's not a doctrine that you or I would have learned if we had been a Christian in any of the churches that were planted by the apostles or by their disciples or by their disciples. In fact, nobody taught it till about 500 years ago. Some people might not have a problem with that, but they should. Because any doctrine that cannot be traced historically to the apostles, like the divinity of Jesus, or the teaching that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, any doctrine that doesn't go all the way back to the beginning like that is problematic because that means that some person or some group of people just came up with it along the way. It was a new interpretation, a new idea. It may have, you know, uh, gained traction. You know, it may have spread. It may have gotten gotten ingrained in people's minds, and so it took hold. And in people's minds, it was it was true. But in reality, it was just a new idea that had never been taught by the church before. Um, and so it wasn't a part of the historic faith. Well, the imputed righteousness of Christ is like that. It was a new idea about 500 years ago. It would have been totally foreign to the people who actually learned from the apostles. And, uh, and so those two things, um, the Bible never says it, and the church didn't teach it till, till the time of the Reformation. Um, if, you, if you really think about that and just try to be objective and, and, and consider that, I think you'll see that it is a problem. So what does the Bible actually say about this? Well, the Bible does speak of imputed righteousness. And it does speak of a garment we are clothed in, or robes that we wear, or a fine linen which Jesus' church is granted to be clothed in. And it's that second idea that I want to focus on in uh, on this video. Because, because the, the the doctrine says, you know, the way many of us the way many of us think of the doctrine is that Jesus' righteousness is like a robe we wear, a robe of righteousness, right? That, that can't be stained, can't take it off. We have it unconditionally, and it makes us clean before God no matter what. Okay, well, um, let's, let's look at what the Bible says about, about the garment, the robes, right? What is that garment that Christians wear? What is this robe that believers get to put on? What does the Bible explicitly say? What are the passages that deal with that actually say about it? I'm going to read a few of those passages because um, I think it's extremely relevant and, and they were very helpful for me um, and see what you think the Bible is, is actually saying about it and then, and then I'll move on to Paul's imputed righteousness passages in the next video. Okay, so here's one that used to be a go-to for me. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. 
The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you in pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Okay, well, as an evangelical reading that, having already learned the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ, I read that passage and just saw what was such a clear picture of someone having their iniquity removed from them and being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the angel of the Lord. I still believe the angel of the Lord is, is Jesus. But um, the passage doesn't, doesn't really say what that means. You know, uh, it doesn't say that it was the righteousness of, of Jesus, obviously. It just says that the iniquity was taken away and he was clothed in pure vestments. And that's all it says. Um, so it's kind of silent on what that means. Um, here's another passage. Uh, from Matthew 22, which highlights how important it is that we have this garment. Um, starting in the, in, the, in the beginning of chapter 22 in Matthew, Jesus tells a parable about a king who throws a wedding feast for his son, but the people that he's invited don't want to go, and instead they abuse his messengers and kill them, and so the king sends his troops to destroy those he invited, and then tells his servants to go out to the main roads and invite as many people as they can to the feast, both good people and bad people. And so they go and they invite lots of people, and then the wedding hall is filled with people. And here is how the parable ends. <clears throat> but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the, attend the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, again, I used to read that and think, Okay, there's that robe of Christ's righteousness. This guy must have been trusting in his own obedience in some way or, or not fully trusting in the righteousness of Christ so he didn't have the righteousness of Christ. That's why he was removed, right? He didn't have that garment of Jesus' perfect righteousness. The passage doesn't say that. It's just I was projecting that onto the passage having already learned that doctrine. Okay, now here are some passages, um, some more passages. Some of them are not explicit in what the garment is, but some of them tell us something. And some of them would have made no sense to me at all a few years ago. And uh, see what you think. Revelation chapter 3 from Jesus' letter to Sardis says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Okay, so Jesus talks about garments that his people are clothed in, but not in the way that I would have, not in the way that I would have expected. 
he says that only a few of the individuals in the church in Sardis have not soiled their garments, which clearly means that the rest of them have soiled their garments. Um, And he says that those who haven't soiled their garments will walk with him in white, for they are worthy. Making a connection between how they're living and their worthiness and whether or not they're, they're in white or, or, or stained. Um, then he says that the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Okay, so seems to be a condition there. In order to be clothed in white garments, you have to conquer. That just flies in the face. I mean, that was so, so such uncomfortable language for me a few years ago. I'm under the impression that this perfect robe of righteousness that I wear can't be soiled, it can't be stained, right? It's always white and pure uh, in the eyes of God. You know, even if I'm in willful sin, because it's not my righteousness, it's Jesus' righteousness. Um, I'm under the impression that I'm eternally secure. I can't, I can't be blotted out of the book of life. And here Jesus says that whatever this white garment is, it can be soiled. And we won't be blotted out of the book of life if we conquer and, and are therefore clothed in white. Um, If Protestant theology is right, I would have expected Jesus to say something like, you know, there are only a few people in Sardis who are living the way I really want them to, but none of you are worthy. All your righteousnesses are like filthy rags, and the only reason you're 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 worthy is because of this this right my righteousness imputed to you. So trust not in your own works, and uh, you know, don't worry because fear not because none of you can be blotted out of the book of life if you have my righteousness. Something like that. That's not what he says. That's not how Jesus thinks about this. Um, So Revelation chapter 7 is another one. speaks of a great multitude in heaven from every tribe standing before God and Jesus, worshiping them clothed in white robes. And verse 13 says this, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so the passage is silent on what the robes are and what it means to wash them and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. We're not sure exactly from this passage what that means. A few years ago, reading this passage in isolation, I would have said the white robes are the imputed righteousness of Jesus, the only way to be pure and holy before God, and and washing your robe uh, and making them white in the blood of the Lamb, that means trusting in what Jesus has done on the cross alone. Um something like that. But reading this along with what we just looked at in Sardis, Jesus' words to Sardis, maybe that's not what washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb means. So these people in this passage, these are the people who are coming out of the Great Tribulation. So the point is that they stayed faithful to Jesus. They didn't take the mark of the beast. They stayed faithful and obedient to the end. So putting that together with his words to Sardis, maybe washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb, means we actually respond to Jesus' death, to his shed blood, by turning from sin, by actually being ransomed from our old lives, actually having our lives washed by Jesus, actually, in reality. Revelation 16.15 is another one. It says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. That's an interesting one. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on. 
So he connects staying awake to keeping the garment on. So it seems like in order to keep the garment on, you need to stay awake. He says, blessed is the one who keeps his garments on. The implication is that you can take the garment off. You can lose the garment, right? Well, why, uh, why, if, if gar the garment is Jesus' imputed righteousness and we can't lose it, can't take it off no matter what we do, why, why you know, um, admonish us to keep the garment on? It doesn't really fit. Revelation 19 is um, a really important one. Um, it's a passage about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So remember in Matthew 22 from a few minutes ago, Jesus told a parable about a wedding feast that a king gives for his son. And in the end, the king goes in and finds a guy with no wedding garment. Right? What is that garment? Well, maybe Revelation 19, which is about the marriage supper of the Lamb, maybe that will tell us something. Verses 6 through 9, it says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, so... Put this together with Matthew 22. What was the issue in Jesus' parable with the man to whom the king says, Friend, how did you get in here with no wedding garment? Was the problem that this person was somehow trusting in his own works? To some degree, was he deriving some hope from the transformation that he saw in his life, thinking that that had something to do with his salvation? And so he didn't, he wasn't trusting in the righteousness of Jesus alone. So he didn't have that garment of Jesus' righteousness and so was removed. Is, is that the problem? The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Maybe the problem was that he wasn't actually living a righteous life. Maybe the problem was that he hadn't responded to Jesus in obedience. Maybe he was just giving Jesus lip service. And so was not wearing the fine linen of righteous deeds. That's what the passage explicitly says. And I, I would have expected this to say that the fine linen is the righteousness of the Son of God, which clothes his bride regardless of, of, of her good deeds. Right? The, the, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Just think about the implications of that. How does that sound to you? How does that sit with you? Does that sound right? Or is that a little, a little uncomfortable? I mean, imagine, imagine your pastor telling the church one Sunday, we all have been given the gift of being able to clothe ourselves in fine linen for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the fine linen is our righteous deeds. It's our good works. How would that go over in your community? Would that be well received by people? Would people nod in agreement with that? Or would people raise an eyebrow? Would their legalism and moralism radars start going off? One more quick one. Revelation twenty two fourteen says this. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Talking about the New Jerusalem. So, silent on what that means to wash their robes. Not sure what that means from the passage, but um, there is an interesting footnote in the ESV Bible on this verse, and it says this. Some manuscripts 
do his commandments. On the first part of that verse. So, in some Greek manuscripts, enough of them to get a footnote in the ESV Bible on this, the verse reads this way. Blessed are those who do his commandments so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Okay, that is very interesting. I'm not saying that that's the way it should read in the Bible, but the fact that that's how it read in, in, in um, some of the Greek manuscripts um, might tell us a little something about how earlier Christians thought about this whole thing. Maybe it tells us something about how the, the writer of Revelation thought about what it means to wash our robes. Maybe it helps us understand what it means to, um, to, to, be, to be clean before God. Right? Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Some manuscripts, blessed are those who do his commandments so they may have the right to the tree of life. Um, so, maybe in order to be clean before God, we have to respond to Jesus in obedience, right? Actually having our, our lives cleansed by him with the power that he provides. We don't do it in our own strength. Um, obviously, it it can't happen without his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, without the Holy Spirit, right? We can't be saved without that. But maybe washing our robes, you know, we, we play a part in that. It's not this passive thing. Um, we wash our robes by obeying Jesus. That's our role in the process. That's what his shed blood is meant to result in. So that might sound like heresy to some people. I realize that. Um, but there are a number of verses in the New Testament that I think um, are uh, relevant here. So let me just read a few more things here, talk about cleansing, and shed some light, I think, on what that looks like. What does it mean to be cleansed by Jesus, and what is our role in that, in that process? How do we wash our robes? So John 15, verses 1 to 3 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Okay, they are clean because of the word he has spoken to them. That was very strange to me when I, when I read that. Um, a while back. Jesus hasn't died yet at this point, but they are already clean in some way. In my mind, the only thing that clean cl cleanses us is his imputed righteousness and his blood. Jesus is not dead yet, but he's saying you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So his word cleansed them. Maybe that means that their lives have been changed. Their lives have been cleansed by his teachings, right? Obviously, he still needs to die for them, for us. But part of how we're cleansed is by having our lives reshaped by what he taught. And sin is, is removed from our lives. Um, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 um, is, is a relevant verse. And just leading up to that, Paul has just been talking about being separate, separate from the world and not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And he reminds them about some of the promises of God to his people in Leviticus and Isaiah, if they will just obey him. And this is what he reminds them about from, from those two Old Testament books. It says, uh, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, so did you catch that order there? It says, touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you and be a father to you. So, 
a few years ago, I would have said, well, that, that's not how it works anymore. Now, now it's unconditional. God is always with his people, no matter what. You know, it's not like it was in the Old Testament. But here, Paul is using these verses from the Old Testament to instruct the Corinthians in the New Testament. So it does still work like that with God and his people in some way. Um, <clears throat> Paul says in verse 1, then, of, of chapter 7, right after that, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So, according to Paul, we should cleanse ourselves and become completely holy in the fear of God. Right? That this is all very much in line with this idea that we wash our robes by obeying Jesus, doing his commandments, um, walking in the way that he wants us to. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 22 says this. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. There it is again. Having purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth. And here's one that totally rocked my world a few years ago. 1 John uh, chapter 1, 6 and 7, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Did you catch that? If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Okay, so there's a condition there. In order to be cleansed by Jesus' blood, we must walk in the light. If you walk in the light, you receive the benefits of Jesus' blood. So there's a connection between being cleansed by Jesus' blood, and how we walk, how we live. So what does it mean to wash our robes in the blood of Jesus? Does it mean just trusting in what he did on the cross, and then his perfect righteousness is imputed to us, and we have this robe on us no matter what now, and we can't be defiled, um, it's, it's unconditional, it has nothing to do with what we do in obedience? I don't see that in Scripture. Um, and the reason that I'm, I'm reading these passages is that there's a lot of talk in the Protestant church about being clothed in Jesus' righteousness unconditionally, being pure and clean before God, regardless of what we do. But here are the passages that actually talk about the garments, the robes, the clothing that we receive as believers. And there is no hint whatsoever from these passages that it's the righteousness of Christ that we are clothed in or that it's this unconditional thing, this, this righteousness that we can't take off, can't stain, you know, it can't get stained no matter what we do. You know, it's got nothing to do with our obedience or our good deeds or anything. In fact, it's just the opposite. So... <clears throat> um, so in light of all that, what those passages actually do explicitly say, what was Paul thinking when he talked about a righteousness that comes from God through faith or a righteousness of God that we receive through faith? Was he, was he really thinking what so many of us think? Was he thinking about a righteousness of Jesus that's imputed to us and we wear it like a robe no matter what? Is that really what was going on in Paul's mind when he wrote those words. Is that a biblical idea, or is that really just a Protestant idea? If that's what Paul had in mind, then why, why didn't he just say that explicitly? You know, why, 
Why didn't he just actually use those words the way our theologians do? If it's such an important truth that's at the heart of the gospel message, wouldn't he want to spell that out in no uncertain terms? And wouldn't the other apostles want to do that too? And, and if that's what Paul meant, then why didn't the early church pick up on that? Why, why didn't they teach it? How come this, this doctrine is only 500 years old? Here's what I think Paul, here's what I think Paul um, basically meant when he talked about imputed righteousness. And I'll, I'll talk more about it in the next video more in depth. But <clears throat> I think what he meant was this. That when someone comes to believe in Jesus, when they repent and turn to him, ready and willing to obey him in faith, God looks at that person and says, okay, I forgive all you've done, and you are now righteous in my sight. Right? He, he doesn't impute sin to them. He doesn't consider them to be sinners who are cut off from him anymore, but he imputes righteousness to them. He considers them righteous because of their faith in Jesus. They are right with him now. They don't need to get circumcised and start living by over 600 laws in Exodus and Leviticus. No. They, they receive a righteousness from God. It doesn't come from the law of Moses. And they get into right standing with God simply because they've come to Jesus in repentance, ready to follow and obey him, faith in Jesus. That is the person who is righteous in God's sight, to whom he will not impute sin. I think it is that simple. And... Many of us have made this way more complicated than it really is um, and have projected ideas onto Paul's words that are not actually there. And I think what Paul is saying is that now in order to remain in right standing with him, we need to continue to follow Jesus and obey him to the end, which God is going to help us to do. And that doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect, that uh, there won't be any struggle against sin in any way going forward. Um, yes, there is a process, and uh, all the writers make that clear. But, but someone can be both completely obedient to Jesus and imperfect at the same time. Right? There's no contradiction there. You can be walking in obedience to everything Jesus said and also make make mistakes along the way, right? Like, like uh, an athlete who has looked at everything that their coach requires of, of him or her and agrees to all of it, even though there's some really hard things on the coach's regimen, right? And, and so they, they start trying to do everything the coach says. And even though they make mistakes and sometimes fall on their face, the coach is merciful and patient with them because they are humble and obedient. They're obedient to everything that he says, but they still, they still mess up. They still, they still can make mistakes or do something imperfectly or they haven't mastered something or something like that, but they're still totally obedient. That's what God requires. Uncompromising obedience to Jesus. So, we're not perfect all of a sudden when we, when we become Christians, but there should be a real, dramatic, lasting transformation that happens right away so that someone who was walking on the wide path, living in sin, turns around, they put their faith in Jesus, right? They turn around, they repent, and now they're on the narrow path. They're set free from sin in a very real way, and they're now living in obedience to Jesus, in love and in holy fear of God striving to obey all that he commanded, S striving forward. They're, they've gone into training in godliness, as Paul says to Timothy. So we strive forward with him in the power that he provides, right? Trusting him to be patient with us in our imperfection as we are more and more molded into the image of Jesus. But if we are nonchalant towards Jesus, if we are picking and choosing which commandments we're actually going to obey and which ones we don't think are reasonable or 
which which ones you know maybe some we don't think make sense in our culture or something like that no we're not going to remain in right standing with god uh, if if we are in ongoing blatant habitual sin right or if we return to our sins and become casual about this um, then then we're in real danger because we're still enslaved to sin. Maybe we've never actually gotten off the wide path, or maybe we we went back to sin. We've soiled our garments, and as as Jesus says to to Sardis, and we can be blotted out of the book of life. This is all explicit in the text of Scripture. So, yes, we do get a garment of righteousness, a robe of righteousness, when we come to Jesus. But it is not his righteousness imputed to us. It's simply that we are in right standing with God. We're, we're cleansed from our former sins because of his supernatural work in our lives. We've been set free after we've been born again, right? We've been, we've been ransomed from our old lives by the blood of Jesus. And, and so what Jesus has done has actually resulted in a very real purification of our lives. When I started to see this, I was um, I was terrified. Um, I went through some some real uh, some real fear because I realized, okay, if these people in Sardis have soiled their garments, people who were living at a time when um, being a Christian actually came with real cost. And when, when they practice obedience to Jesus' commandments, much more literally, um, if, if they have soiled their garments, then I can't imagine what my garment must look like to Jesus, someone who has basically been ignoring some of his commandments um, for almost my entire life as a Christian, someone who has continued in... Uh, sexual immorality with pornography um, throughout my entire life as a Christian. And I think that fear that I experienced was actually healthy and good. I think, I think it might be the sort of fear that many people in the church in Sardis experienced when they heard these shocking words of Jesus about them for the first time. It was a good thing. It was a healthy thing. I'm sure it helped many of them to, to, to repent and get serious about following Jesus again. And it's not a bad thing. Um, and thankfully, God is merciful and ready to forgive any of us, anyone who is ready to repent, and um, as in change our lives, not just our mind. Um, and so... He's, he's good, he's kind, he's merciful, and, uh, and ready to help us if we are ready to, to make the effort. Okay, well in the next video I'm going to discuss uh, three of Paul's famous passages about the righteousness of God. One from Romans, one from 2 Corinthians, and one from Philippians. And uh, I hope this has been worth your time, and uh, thank you so much for watching. And God bless you.